the entire world is talking about what happens after 2015. What should the development look like? There's also greater consensus that development, the pathway has to be different to what we have been on so far. The main reason for this, as you all know, is because we are facing a very severe environmental challenge. Development has come as the cost of the environment, and it is now no longer possible to think that we can have unlimited growth. Also, the issues have been that in this development pathway, although we have made progress in terms of reducing poverty, reducing things like child mortality, uh, maternal deaths, uh, it, it, we are still dealing with lots of people who still remain poor, 47% of them who the World Bank says lives in South Asia. So for South Asia, the challenge is immense. We have to have better growth, we have to have better equality, and we have to protect our natural resources. Hence, the need to think differently about development, I think, is paramount. And this is the main reason that SEPA is also interested in this topic, and interested in this topic from a South Asia perspective, because we feel that there is a lot the region needs to do to engage with this uh, agenda that it should also be something that the region can set and that they can set their own priorities. Um, hence, the, since the world is talking about the next, next set of gold, it actually gives us a good opportunity to also engage with it and also present those ideas in those forums. And right now, the forums are quite heavily led by the Global North, as they're called, and there is a need to bring in a lot more perspective from the Global South. Hence, today's meeting, uh, the next two days, what, what we are aiming for is that we talk about some critical issues uh, for South Asia, issues that we would like uh, to be taken up in terms of larger development goals. And the reason that um, we are partnering with uh, the Center for Policy Dialogue, the Sustainable Development Policy Institute, um, sorry, CP, Center for Policy Dialogue is from Bangladesh, the Sustainable uh, Develop, uh, Development Policy Institute is from Pakistan, Practical Action Sri Lanka, and the South Asia Policy and Research Institute from Sri Lanka is because all these institutions are interested in this topic, are involved in different forums that are taking this message forward, especially um, the Southern Voice Initiative and the Club de Madrid actually have a presence in the high-level panel discussions. There are also others of you here from TWN, from Badanatu Todo, and I'm sure ODI and different places also who actually have links and have been dealing with the, the global discussions. So we hope that the engagements here uh, will be taken forward by you uh, to these different forums. Uh, SEPA is also involved in the People's Forum, which, which is a part of the Chogam, which takes place next week, which is also talking about MDGs and what are the Commonwealth's issues for the MDGs. And we will be uh, feeding this information into the sessions there as well. Um, I'd also like to just mention the uh, part, uh, supporters of this event, uh, IDRC's Think Tank Initiative, the Swiss Development Corporation, um, Dialog, and Ya TV, who have extended their support to make this event possible. Uh, the sessions are structured so that there are, I mean, obviously we can't address all the issues that are necessary. So we have picked four issues uh, that have come up in the global debates as being very important. And they are also ones that are heavily debated. Uh, so it's on that basis that the topics have been chosen, and they are in your agendas, and they have, and you can um, download more information on the topics from our website. Um, and the way it will be structured is that the sessions will have position papers and presenters. Position papers meaning overall content into the topic. Uh, position pa uh, presenters will then stimulate the discussion by giving us a couple of things to think about. The discussions will respond to that, and then we would like it to open it out to the uh, larger forum. The reason this year is a much smaller group, and this is a, a, a different 
to how SEPA normally does its symposiums because we do try to get as many people as possible to come. The reason it is restricted this year is because we really want you to, to have a dynamic conversation and really engage with the topics and have a really good uh, discussion. So we have also tried very hard to leave as much time as possible uh, for discussions. Uh, and we really hope that you will engage um, and also enjoy the session. Um, a couple of housekeeping issues uh, before we move on. <coughs> the sessions are being streamed uh, and because of that we really request that you use your mics because if you don't then the, the streaming has no sound and when you're done with your mic, you do we need to switch them off? Yes? Keep them on all the time? Okay. So you don't need to switch it off, so keep it on, but please do talk, to the, uh, talk into the mic. Um, uh, in the interest of trying as much as possible to reduce our, our footprint, uh, we have not printed everything. Uh, it's all on your sticks and it's all also on our, our website. Um, we will have Wi-Fi eventually in this room, hopefully in a little while. And you can get on and uh, check your, um, uh, get online and actually download the presentations. Um, so let me invite, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Indrajit Kumaraswamy, who is going to chair the first session. The first se he is uh, uh, on the board of director of both SEPA and SAPRI, and I believe many other companies uh, and organizations. He is also a former director of the Commonwealth Secretariat. He will lead the first session on demystifying MDGs and setting the context. And as the name suggests, it's really about trying to give the, the symposium, the overall context. Why are we doing this? What are the issues in the larger discussions? And uh, setting the stage for our discussions of the next two days. Uh, let me also invite Dr. Debapriya Bhattacharya, Dr. Sheria Toru Khan, uh, Bhatia Kakulanda, and Priyanti Fernando to also come up and be a part of the first session. So hopefully you will have interesting and dynamic discussions and it's fine to have different views. That is exactly what we want so that you can thrash it out. Thank you. Good morning. Um, particularly, I'd like to particularly welcome those of you who've come from abroad and welcome to all of you. Um, I think uh, my responsibility um, in this session is to make some preliminary remarks to set the stage. Now, Karen has done such an excellent job um, that I'm going to take a slightly different tack uh, in terms of. Uh, contributing to um, giving some background uh, to, this, to this symposium. And what I thought I would do was really to look back at the genesis of the MDGs with a view to considering whether we can learn some lessons, whether some of the things that slipped off the development framework at that time uh, need to be addressed this time around. Uh, as we look for a framework for the post-2015 era. Now, as you all know, the MDGs have enjoyed sustained support of government, civil society, um, uh, the development community in general uh, for the last decade. And as Karen said, we've had commendable progress on a number of fronts, though there are significant disparities both within and across countries. Now, as you also know, the MDGs emerged as a practical and measurable articulation of the Millennium Declaration, which was adopted by the high-level segment of the UNGA, that's the heads of government sector segment of the UNGA in, in 2000. And in terms of going back to the genesis of the 
MDGs, it's instructive to consider the global landscape as it was in the lead up to the Millennium Declaration. And you will recall that the Asian crisis had just taken place in 1997-98. The contagion effects had spread to other uh, uh, emerging markets uh, around the world, and even the markets of developed countries uh, were under threat at one point. Now, at that time, there was a kind of emerging sentiment that one needed a reform of the global economic governance arrangements, reform of the international financial architecture. There was a sentiment that emerged at that time. But the world economy recovered very quickly, and the enthusiasm for systemic reform waned equally quickly, particularly among those powerful countries who had a vested interest in the status quo. So when, you know, in that context, when the developed world first advanced the MDGs, it was very tempting to consider it as a bit of a red herring, to divert attention from the systemic reforms that were necessary to give the Global South a greater voice in terms of global economic governance, the international financial architecture, etc. Furthermore, primarily by focusing on the social pillar of development, one clearly had a imbalance in terms of the three pillars uh, that underpin development. So a more holistic approach, which adopted a more balanced approach across the economic, social, and environmental pillars would clearly have been preferable. One could argue, therefore, that the MDGs were a suboptimal outcome, that they were a necessary but not sufficient condition for a framework for development. So this raises the question as to why they became so widely accepted. And there, I think uh, one should recall a, an effective parallel narrative that was around at that time, which was used to justify the framework that was eventually adopted for the MDGs. Because you know, at the end of the Cold War, which was usually marked by the, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, there was a lot of optimism that there would be a peace dividend. And that part of the peace dividend would be diverted to deliver a development dividend as well. That there would be significant increases in ODA flows. However, what transpired in the 1990s was actually a significant decline in ODA. There was a peace dividend, but the peace dividend was used by the donor countries, one, to put their own finances in order, and two, to support transformation in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. So what really happened was that ODA fell. So by the time you got to the, to the dawn of the new millennium, um, there was considerable donor fatigue. And there was this very negative uh, narrative in the Western media about corruption, mismanagement in the developing world, particularly in Africa. So the MDGs really were seen as a framework that would help to win over the hearts and minds of taxpayers in these countries, in the donor countries. So that was, a, in a way, the justification that was given for what was significantly, uh, which was um, uh, largely a more limited agenda than would, be, would have been ideal. So you had um, this focus essentially on things like you know, extreme poverty, uh, maternal mortality, girls' education, etc., which were issues that the, the Western, uh, the donor uh, country taxpayers could relate to and support. So you saw upturn in ODA buy into the MDG process, and we've gone through 10 years. Now, of course, now there's been a reduction in ODA because of the global financial crisis, but that has been more than made up for by the rise of China, the impact on commodity prices because of that, Chinese investment in infrastructure, India, though much less significant, has also become a new donor. So really, you've had this support coming through. On balance, I think one could conclude that the MDG framework did get significant amount of mileage, though partial. So now what we need to ask ourselves is what do we need to focus upon as we go forward? Do we need a more holistic approach to the economic and environmental pillars 
Do they need to be integrated more centrally into the new framework? What about the systemic issues which slipped off the table? Do we need attention to the international financial architecture? What about the international trading system? Is it as development friendly as it, as it should be? The Doha round, which was launched on the premise of development friendly outcomes, has got stuck. The global negotiations on a climate convention are stuck. There's a high priority that needs to be attached to financing and technology transfer in that framework. That is not really moving forward. So given all this, what should be the framework? And I hope over the next two days, we will be able to address some of these issues. Now, that's by way of uh, introduction. Um, we have with us an extremely eminent uh, group of speakers who will address the, this kind of setting the context uh, um, remit that has been given for this session. Uh, and we will start with Dr. Bhattacharya, who is chair of the Southern Voice Initiative and distinguished fellow at the Center for Policy Dialogue. And his topic is going to be current debates and activities in the MDG SDG global discussion. Now, I think if one is to talk of Southern Voices, I think Dr. Bhattacharya's name is really synonymous with that. He's been a leading proponent. Uh, of the, the, globe, the positions of the Global South on this subject and on other subjects. Uh, he has tremendous experience across a range of development issues, so it's a great pleasure for us to have Dr. Bhattacharya to address us. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Can I start with taking off my jacket? Uh, of course. I, I can't deny you what I've uh, <laughs> treated myself to. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chair, for that very <coughs> kind and very illuminating introduction. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Um, let me first express my deep satisfaction for being here today. And uh, I take this opportunity to congratulate SEPA under the leadership of Priyante and the great work done by Karin in bringing us all over here. And I, as an institutional person, I know how much time and energy and creativity it takes uh, to organize a session like this. And SEPA had been always trying to be different from many others, mainstream thinkers. So in that sense, they have put in, uh, what do you say, a lot of innovation in designing the, uh, the two-day meeting. Uh, it, it's all, uh, I also yeah. like to compliment uh, SEPA also as a part of our South Asian fraternity and also as a member of the Southern Voice and Post-MDG International Development Goals. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here, and I feel honored uh, to make this uh, curtain raising presentation, uh, which is a very wide canvas thing. And I, I don't think everybody will find everything there. And definitely, uh, I try to be less provocative here and try to be more you know, more p positive in the sense that they give some of the information and leave, let the House debate the issues as we go. And as, as, as I approach the presentation, I am remembering now how many, many, many more issues I have left out. Uh, but let me see uh, whatever I have over here at this moment. I think uh, the introduction from Dr. Kumar Sami was very, very helpful. It gave us the political context, the economic circumstances, and the discussions which were really uh, dominating the development discourse in the end of 1990s. And, uh, and how the MDGs have come about, uh, I think the, the, the word used, it was uh, necessary but not sufficient. It avoided the systemic issues, but at the same time tried to keep up the energy of the taxpayers, donor, uh, donors, and the taxpayers. Now, if you look back, then there is, had been another uh, distinguishing feature of the MDG formulation. It was produced in a political vacuum. There was no consultation. Uh, it was a top-down approach. Um, basically, the Secretariat has worked with certain member states, and then it was uh, approved. So in contrast, this time around, you will see that a lot of discussions are taking place around the world. Uh, there are a lot of streams of discussions which are taking place. And they have progressed over the last year and a half. And we are, we are approaching now at a critical juncture in many ways. Um, the, the, oh, 
large part of the discussion had been uh, done under the auspices of the United Nations, but individual organizations and definitely the non-government stream, including the private sector, had been quite active in this space. But, and, uh, but the le le theoretically, the leadership is provided by the UN and its Secretary General. But if you look at the context, the way the MDG is currently being produced, there are two different processes which are trying to become, are being brought together. The one process which comes from the, the 2000 uh, summit, MDG summit, when it was produced and thereafter, uh, in 2010, when the summit uh, took place to review the outcomes and the future, and then and, and he thought of uh, having an MDG Mark II, phase two, because given its success and the unfinished agenda and everything together. On the other hand, there is a second process which has come uh, out, which is definitely the, the Rio Plus 20 conference, which created the open working groups. I'll talk about, later, about that later. And now these two processes are supposed to merge, and they're supposed to merge and create the sustainable development goals uh, in ways. These two processes are, at some points they're cooperating, at some point they're, co they're, they're contesting each other. So it will be very, very interesting to see how two different international processes under the same institutions come and merge and produce an, uh, in, in a, an unanimous uh, set of consensus set of goals. Now the current stream of works, as I say, I mention here only three of the major streams of work. One which comes with the UN task system, uh, ta a task force, uh, that the task team is essentially the uh, at the, is the nodal organization of the various UN system or and system agencies and others. And, and they have produced a report uh, which was also, uh, which was, uh, which were the report was also based on some of the surveys which went on, my world survey and others, and realizing the future we want for all in the report was produced first in June 2012. See, it was one of the first reports which came out in many ways. You have h heard about this much vaunted high level panel which was co-chaired by the Indonesian president, the Liberian president and the prime minister of UK. One could have thought that not a very, uh, quite an unusual choice on the part of the OECD countries. Uh, to be a co-chair, but this uh, this got a lot of political traction, and finally, uh, this year in May they have brought out the uh, report, a new global partnership, uh, which was, uh, I, as you know, was uh, the lead author was Homi Karas, and many others colleagues were involved, and so this report is essentially one of the must-read type of thing which goes around and nowadays. Then we, uh, apart from these high-level panels, you may know that there had been other. Um, outputs which are related to the post-MDG framework. One important one is the, which I don't mention here, but I will refer to the reports later, is the SDNS, the Sustainable Development Network Solution, which is led by, S S SDNS is led by Professor Jeffrey Sachs, and they have also come out with one report. Then there is another report, which is also the, a very interesting one, and I will strongly recommend that you may take a glimpse at it, is the, is the private sector's report on global compact and how it, over there, and they have interesting ideas from private sector partnership. Uh, ap uh, apart from these, there are also various types of NGO reports and also uh, the, the re regional recommendations synthesized by the NGLS, uh, the non-government liaison office of the UN system. So those are very interesting things as well. Number of blogs are in operation, uh, and also uh, there are other uh, the discussions or reports, contributions coming from specific areas, for example, for education, for health, for physically challenged people, for the excluded ones, and etc. And now then we have the, apart from these uh, inputs coming in, then there, uh, the debate had been always that whether the, what is the legal status of these inputs? The whether, how do they relate to the intergovernmental process? Now the member states have made it clear these are only for consideration and only of inputs given to the Secretary General. And the Secretary General, as deems fit, will absorb them or recycle them as appropriate as he has done in the last uh, UN General Assembly meetings uh, in his report and will be coming through in 2014. And the intergovernmental process takes up beyond these uh, which is the more which they think is the has the re legal status or the jurisdiction in that way mandate to negotiate is the open working group is a quasi negotiating body in some ways open working groups were created in the post uh, as you may know in Rio plus 20 and the open work working groups had been in session throughout this year and and uh, they are possibly ending in March 
the next meeting, which is in November, uh, the, the, in the third week of November, they will be uh, discussing the macroeconomic issues, investment finance, etc. And in December, before Christmas, there is the last uh, this year's last meeting, uh, which is on uh, the issues related to countries with special needs, including least developed countries, SIDs, country, fragile states, um, ex and the countries in conflict, and etc. So open working group is the some way the connection between the non-governmental processes or the consultative processes and the, uh, and the intergovernmental uh, discussion which we have. Now in September, we had an important meeting of the UNGA. And, and, in the, and the, the results of that is that this will give you the time frame within which we will be operating that the intergovernmental negotiation will be launched in 2014 in September. So before that, we are going to conclude the outcomes of the intergovernmental negotiations uh, uh, of the, uh, through the open working group. They will come out with a report before that. And then we will, uh, the SG will gi give the summary of all the negotiations in 2015. And in 2015, we are going to have a head of government meeting, which will declare the new framework, whatever that means at this point in time. So you, you now know that we still have almost m um, two years to go uh, to for, the, for this discussion. If you, um, and, and if you look at the discussion, one of the critical points I wanted to mention is that that this discussion didn't have, although it was a widely consultative process, still didn't have the, the voice of the South or the developing countries in many ways. I mentioned here four major reasons why the voice of the South was not very heard in this case. The first, the first point was the participation shortfall. If you look at the participation shortfall, I mean from the developing countries, because the, the, number, the, the amount of energy and technical expertise it necessitates in order to be plugged in into the system, that, that is definitely not available within the developing countries. That is, and that is, uh, and, and, and a mission in New York with six people cannot really cope up with all these things, what is happening around in that city at the same time. Uh, if you look at even one country, and, and I'm sure my colleagues are here from UK, they will vouch it for me, that how much resources the U U UK government, given its leadership role in the high-level panel, have invested in terms of uh, putting in money, human resource, and other technical capacities in getting those things. In comparison, I think all the southern countries together didn't have that much in, uh, at, at their disposal. So the second point was also capacity deficit, because those people who are negotiating over there are basically diplomats. And they did not necessarily have all the technical expertise and were not necessarily also plugged into the home country resources uh, like your, uh, yourselves and others in, in different countries. So there was a significant capacity deficit. Thirdly, I, I, co I contend that there were, um, um, there, there were knowledge asymmetry. And this knowledge asymmetry obviously ref reflected in the qu quality of work. And finally, the power imbalance, which is always there, underpins the knowledge asymmetry. So these are some of the issues which were there. Uh, the, this is a, um, uh, if the PowerPoint is circulated, you will, be, uh, you will know that the process discussion has completed. The content generation is currently going on. And we are now uh, approaching the negotiation and the debate phase at this moment. Now, let, I have been shown that I have five minutes left. So, but I, I have just got to the framework issues over here. Now, the framework issue, the first point is that where is, will be the emphasis? Will the emphasis be on finishing on the, finishing of the job, that is the unfinished agenda, or it is the add-on, the next agenda? So which one, the balance between new issues and the finishing the agenda, uh, the MDG agenda, has been the cr one of the critical points where we, where we don't have any consensus as yet. And there are also prioritization of the issues in that way, what has been called getting to zero that you do zero uh, imbalances over there in certain areas. So whether we will get some prioritization over there. As you may know, in MDG, there was no prioritization as such. In the future, whether we go into that. Uh, the architecture is always being a matter of discussion. I put before you, these are the two slides. This is a comparative slide of the three reports of the HLP, the SDNS report, and the Global Compact report. And you will see that uh, in uh, uh, how do they s define sustainable development? Now, if you look at the HLP report, they have taken the traditional path of defining the three pillars of sustainable development, the social dimension, economic dimension, and environmental. The interesting part of the SDNS report is that 
beyond apart from this besides these three they have added a new pillar that is the good governance this will be interesting to see whether this house really thinks it is time that we move from the three pillars of the of the sustainable development to the fourth pillar that is the governance pillar which might be anybody may consider also a cross cutting pillar but whether there is any value in of in having that uh, pillar separately over there yeah if you look at the global compact report their their definition of sustainable development is totally different uh, they put in the poverty aspects the poverty issues and how they have a pyramid over there if you go to the report they will find that and then the human needs and capacities and then the resource triad and resource triad is the energy and climate water and sanitation agriculture and food and the enabling environment this is close enabling environment com comes close to the governance issues possibly but more than that here the enabling issues uh, are environment is both the national regional and the global in many ways now the challenge is how the idea of sustainable development with all its pillars are going to balance out itself currently the debate is that whether the rio plus 20 group is going to hijack it from the uh, which are essentially the environmental oriented uh, uh, organizations and people uh, hijack the whole mdg agenda from the development group as as it goes and and this is an issue which is going on uh, both sides have their own merits and demerits i'll be very i'll be very interested to know how this house looks at that development versus environment or or to put it more crudely growth inclusive growth versus environment issues how how this house will go about now i there at the compares i lost it yes i have it okay <laughs> Uh, and this is uh, if you see the comparative analysis of the goals and targets of the three major reports the hlp sdns and the global compact you see all of them have been very 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 circumspect in terms of or very restrained in terms of giving out the number of goals the 10 to 12 that is the average number because it was eight out there so people thinks that you cannot go too far and the targets are 30 and none of them went for giving the indicators as yet so it is a, and you will see um uh, as i if you see the green ones are usually the totally overlapping goals the yellow ones are these marginally overlapping but with different emphasis and you will see the red ones they, these are where there are no targets separately from others look at that no uh, create hlp says create job sustainable livelihood and equitable growth no separate goals on sdns but it reduces it mentions youth unemployment i'm just taking an example but the global compact doesn't consider it as a separate goal thinks it will be a total outcome of their sustainable development uh, issues or natural resources global compact no separate goals targets but they bring in under the triad you know uh, this I, i mentioned water uh, water air and land in that way uh, and cheerful peaceful society had been a major area of debate post conflict countries and other issues uh, sdns doesn't put it over there but others have got there let me move on the the second major challenge which is there which is the fight between also the tension between the universalist and the developmentalists if i may call them in a crude way you see the universalists are talking about the global agenda and so you have a sustainable universal framework but this all origin of mdgs had been recognition of the uneven level of development of different countries so how do you really and which will mean they will have different needs and different priorities how do you accommodate the national priorities and the special needs of developing countries within an universal framework and if and whether that universal framework will have adequate integrity in the area of environment so you may whether, whether the question is whether you're going to have a lose lose situation which means you give away the specific focus on gov, uh, on development but you do not really win as much you should have on the environment agenda particularly on climate issues and other uh, sustainable consumption structure <coughs> that concern is very much out there at this moment poverty agenda everybody agrees this is one area where everybody is in full com uh, compliance uh, or consensus that we need to that on the inequality issue there is obviously no uh, at this moment no agreement because inequal everybody understand income inequality is not good enough there is multi dimensionality of inequality is everybody accept everybody understands the access issue is important <clears throat> but how do you really in reflect which dimension of inequality in this particular way will it be done in the universal framework or it should be taken up at the country level inclusive growth 
MDG never had the growth issue, but we now know through research that it is very difficult to have, re have sustainable improvement and health and education w without an inclusive growth agenda in that way. But how that will be defined, that is a different issue, but we should all remember MDG never had a macroeconomic framework. Some considered it to be its weakness, some considered it to be an advantage as a flexibility. So this is something where it would be there. Gainful employment is also another area where they should be exclusively targeted because MDG's targets were not good enough. The major criticism coming from the developing countries is that the lack of emphasis on productive capacity building. Without structural transformation of the economies, with these, all these progresses will not be remain sustainable and predictable and also, in, in that sense, inclusive. Because if people need to have income, people need to have decent jobs, and that has to be, be, has to be predictable and sustainable in, in many ways. So this is an issue which is there. And the structural transformation on productive capacity has a broader connotation. It means growth of modern agriculture. It doesn't mean only industry, industry, of course, and high value services and infrastructure in that way. Financing options. Uh, I won't go into details. We can discuss it in the course of the day, next two days. But there are two major consensus now coming around on the financing options. The first option is that, yes, ODA is important. Keep the promises of 0.7% of the GNI of the OECD countries. But it is not enough. That of consensus is coming through. I think it is also being partly accepted by the developing countries. The second, the second point which is coming through, the second consensus, finance is not enough. It is the, met, the instruments of implementation cannot be only finance. It has to also deal with the rules and regulations of global governance. It has to do, the mentions had been made, it has been mentioned that we, we need to have a more uh, development-friendly trade rules. And given the Doha round stalling with the Bali meeting coming, that is also an issue. The issue is, of course, the financial architecture. The issue is, of course, climate negotiation. The issue is also about intellectual property right regime, whether this one is really creating the balance between the innovators and the consumers. So IPR regimes, trade, investment, and all these issues have to come together in some way or another. And so, ODA is important, but not enough. So we have to go into domestic resource mobilization and many others. The second, finance is important, but not enough. So we will have to go into other means of implementation. From aid to sustainable growth and public goods, that is the other areas. Global partnership, it is now being said that it is not only the ODA issue which is, has to be there, but along with the ODAs, we are talking about South-South cooperation, the new elements coming in. Along with that, <coughs> we are talking about parliamentarians, private sector, non-government organization to be involved in the implementation and delivery of it. How, will we, how we are going to in integrate all these multi-stakeholders into a country-to-country -country or, or an intergovernmental structure within which is an issue which has to be seen. One word which has becoming very, very popular, please remember it, call, it is called data revolution. Uh, I don't know how much revolution we can do there, but it is the issue of reforming the, or strengthening that information base. From the southern perspective, data is not only necessary for monitoring or delivering things, it is an instrument for transparency and accountability. For us, it is an instrument of, instrument of <laughs> accountability and uh, transparency, so we are giving a lot of emphasis on these issues. I can discuss what we are going to do in the coming days in there. Governance is an issue uh, because governance, uh, p there is a strong view that the corruption governance uh, or the bureaucratic deficit, uh, the governance deficit is impacting on the sustainability of the outcome. But what do we mean by governance? There is no, obviously, no consensus because some of us, the developed countries think governance means what is happening in the country. Many of us in the South, we think governance should include also the governance structure of the international organizations, including IMF, World Bank, and UN included. So the last point is that sh where shall we emphasize on? The, in the MDG, the major emphasis was on inputs and quite often on outputs, but we have understood in the process access is important, and more importantly, outcome is important. We can send all our children to school. They may also graduate, but they may not be able to have marketable skills. So they comp the quality of education is important, so outcome is important. I think that is a new realization which is coming. So the coming months are very important, and so we are having this meeting. I think the intergovernmental process is, in, is entering into a new phase, uh, the important phase. And the issue is, the challenge for us, at least from the Southern Voice perspective, how we are going to keep the voice alive 
when the intergovernmental process takes over the, pro uh, the negotiations and outcome. Because till now, it was our time. We were discussing, we are being consulted, and et cetera. Now the whole thing will get into the negotiating room in New York with all the member states, and also particularly some equal among the equal, uh, more equal than the others. And finally, when the document comes up, will there be any scope for us to react to that for any revisions on, on that? So it will all depend on us how much prepared we will be when it really comes out and in the coming months. So I hope this discussion will contribute to finding a way out for that. Thank you very much for the indulgence. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Bhattacharya. That, that's a wonderful launch uh, to our deliberations. It was an extraordinarily comprehensive and substantive uh, uh, presentation of great clarity. I think that's extremely helpful. Now, the marching orders that Karen has given me is that at this point I should entertain a few, few points of clarification, just points of clarification, but we're a bit behind schedule. So I hope at the end, exactly. So I hope you will I'm permit me. Yeah, if that's okay. I have written up my own time, so I can't <laughs> complain. <laughs> so we, we'll leave that uh, to the Q&A session at the end. Now next we have uh, Dr. Sharia Toru Khan, uh, with an associate fellow um, for Sustainable Development Policy, uh, sorry, associate fellow from the Sustainable Development Policy Institute in Pakistan. And his um, theme is going to be Emerging Development Challenges for South Asia in a post-2015 sustainable development framework. Dr. Khan leads several, I think you've got brief CVs in your packages, uh, on your stick, so I'm not gonna go into any detail, but Dr. Khan does lead uh, on a number of streams of work uh, at SDPI, so Dr. Khan. Uh, is it Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you very much for, uh, I would like to thank SIPA for inviting me uh, uh, and uh, giving me an opportunity to present, uh, can you all hear me? Uh, giving me an opportunity to present my uh, views. Uh, of late, I've been thinking a lot about, uh, you know, as to what, what are the real problems in, in, in Pakistan, and obviously then that problem leads to uh, a much uh, larger problems in, of, uh, of in South Asia, and uh, as uh, already pointed out by our, uh, in, in, in this uh, preliminary discussion, that it is very difficult to actually pin down. It is very difficult to actually find out, you know, what are we really dealing with in terms of sustainable development, in terms of the so many agendas of uh, issues that are concerns our states in South Asia. So, so before I um, uh, initiate my, uh, my my initial thoughts. You know what? What really comes to my mind is it's is two important issues. Uh, you know, number one is what are the rising concerns to human development in South Asia, and and secondly, development problems and recent development thinking. So we need to really look at these uh, first two issues. Uh, you know, in 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 from a very uh, comprehensive uh, and and uh, uh, and in a focused way. Uh, before we can actually lay, lay down some uh, um, uh, any framework of uh, trying to uh, build consensus here or trying to uh, come up with some kind of uh, uh, solutions. Uh, uh, and and so, so the first two points would lead to, hopefully would lead to the, the third one, which would be the post-development agenda. Uh, so if you look at the state of governance, uh, to me, and as I was, uh, you know, I've been involved in projects which concerns a uh, lot of institutions in Pakistan and also concerns, you know, the problems of governance in Pakistan. I, I see that you know, there's a major uh, governance problem in, in, in South Asia. Uh, if you look at the, the you know, majority of South Asians live under poor social and economic conditions, which is captured by many uh, de development reports and as you have already come across, uh, and most of you are already working on some of the projects which directly look at these kind of issues of, of poverty, education, illiteracy, growth, and all that. Uh, so, uh, and, and particularly the less privileged, partic and the women are vulnerable to demographic and, uh, and, and insecure conditions. Uh, to cite uh, the Human Development Report uh, on South Asia, recent uh, South Asia, 400 million illiterate adults, and out of 400 million, 250 are women. One billion people are without access to improved sanitation services, and more than 160 million are without access to drinking water. Now, I, I've put this deliberately. I've put these statistics deliberately as we are talking about post-development uh, goals and framework. You know, I ask a question, 
Now, what happens to these figures? So where are we now? Uh, have we ever asked ourselves, or have we ever thought about what has gone wrong uh, in, 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 in the state and economy? And what we have been doing uh, when we look at these figures here, and uh, you know, um, I might may sound a bit um, pessimistic, but but at least you know, I, I unless we lay down some concrete suggestions here, I think that situation is not going to improve. There are many children in in you know, I'm, I'm keep referring to the context of Pakistan because similar issues in India and similar issues in Bangladesh and similar issues in Sri Lanka. Uh, that you know, there are children without access to water, there are children uh, not going to schools, there are issues of access, uh, and all these problems are still there. So have we ever really thought about you know, as to you know, what are the real issues here? W what are we dealing with? Are we dealing with this, some kind of economic growth? Are we dealing with sustainability? And, you know, uh, and, and frankly speaking, it really confuses me how to bring about this um, so sustainable, you know, sustainability from the point of view, uh, if you look at it from the World Bank perspectives. Uh, because that is, they, they really describe this governance issues in a more sort of abstract level by trying to analyze the developing countries or the South Asian countries with, kind of, with some kind of a framework which uh, look at these uh, idealistic kind of society. Well, we, we do not have that kind of societies here. We are talking about people in extreme poverty. We are talking about people, uh, people who uh, have um, lost on economic growth. But maybe th all these policies are fine in terms of laying down a framework, in terms of telling the, the people, in terms of making the, you know, uh, letting us know that here we are. But when we come to st state specific and institutions and the country level analysis, the situation is still bleak and, uh, uh, and I hope it gets better. Uh, so if, you, if, if I look at it as a governance, as a fundamental development challenge in South Asia, primarily, uh, you know, but when we ask, when I, when I say this, uh, you know, I ask a question, you know, why the states in South Asia have failed to implement policies conducive to sustainable development? So why have we failed? You know, what are the reasons for, uh, for we, we keep talking about this growth and targets, MGDs and uh, development goals, but what are the re real reasons of not achieving them? Or, you know, or maybe some countries are close to achieving some of the Millennium de Development Goals uh, but by and large, we are far off from middle income goals. And I, and I look at it that you know our institutions are um, over politicized, uh, clientelistic forms of political and social behavior, uh, weak accountability and institutionalized corruption, uh, continuous decline or the weakening of state institutions, <coughs> and finally, you know all these points have implications for sustainable de uh, development here. So I think that. Uh, when we talk about any uh, framework for development or when we talk about uh, uh, you know, implications of uh, uh, sustainable development on governance and governance, uh, et cetera, I think we need to, need to look at the way our institutions perform. Uh, are we looking at the, the problems of governance from uh, organizational perspective? Are we looking at in terms of capacity of improving state capacity? I think that uh, we, we have not really addressed the core issue which is looking at the deep structures, which is looking at the, the, the problems of governance in our country, and what kind of institutions do we have, and how do we improve the lives of the people, particularly when the state represents the elites, and they, they, they do not really pay attention to, to, to the, the people, to the common man, uh, because if you have a kind of a political structure uh, which creates rents, uh, and by creating rents, they attempt to uh, solidify their own power, and by this, they are unable to uh, let the power uh, distribute across the society. So it is a very basic problem here. Uh, I think that the, 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 you know, the, the, the state of the institutions are the primary institutions upon which uh, rests the de agenda of development. Now, it is fine to talk about the, 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 the growth and, and et cetera, but um, it is always the states, and I think that the states cannot be removed. The states cannot be, you know, all the NGOs are doing a lot of work here uh, and trying to, you know, uh, make the states aware that, you know, here are the problems. But, but really, in a sense, when we talk about the supply side, the supply side and the demand side, they both need, they both need to be equated. They both need to be talking to each other. So on one state, on one on one hand, we have the state organizations, the institutions problem here, and on the other hand. 
you know, the, 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 a lot of NGOs in Pakistan and, and Sustainable Development Policy Institute, for example, are working with the communities or some of uh, the, 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 the poverty analysis center in, in, in across South Asia are working with the communities. But the real problem is that th all these uh, uh, reforms have not been really institu institutionalized. So, so if, if you look at it from um, sort of an abstract uh, level, we need to build our framework around, around uh, reconceptualizing governance, as rightly pointed out by uh, Dr. Devesh there, uh, that you know, how do you define governance? So governance is, uh, uh, is it the governance uh, by looking at, by judging at the institutions with reference to some modern states? Well, we need to uh, reconceptualize this framework. We need to look at governance by analyzing the, steep, the deep structures. Now, I'm deliberately using these words from an abstract level because I would require a lot of time. But we need to look at governance from a non-normative perspective. Governance is not simply about, it is about accountability, it is about corruption, it is about all, all that, but it, it has been uh, analyzed as an as an idealistic form of government. We need to uh, look at governance from the perspective of the everyday state, what we have, the institutions, the way our organizations perform, the way we perform business. So is it going to be the governance based on the realities of the people? Is it going to be the governance which reflects the true understanding of how the states and the organizations perform in South Asian states? Unless we uh, look at the governance from deep structures perspective, um, which actually provides the context of exploring the gap between the institutions and which effectively shape the society and the formal organizations. So I think that the, the, the foremost point is, uh, in, is that governance is a huge challenge to South Asian countries. And secondly, any reform agenda has to look at the governance from the deep structures perspective. And by, and by which I mean that this is the time that we need to look at the, the, the quality of our state, the quality of our institutions. And, uh, or is it going to be uh, you know, business as usual? Because uh, what, what uh, we have been doing so far is that I have been personally involved, I can give you a few examples here, I, can, I have been personally involved in capacity development measures. And uh, I have seen closely the functioning of the, the, of the government with a lot of training, uh, with a lot of technical support, a huge amount of money going into this training and technical support, and the, the, the outcome was business as usual. So the, the, the organizational or the informal practices of the states do not really improve with, uh, with whatever resources you give on. It is not actually about the resources. It is always about the direction. It is always about you know, what is it that you want to achieve in terms of improving the, the, the social and economic lives of the people, and how do you do that? Uh, uh, we may need this uh, framework. We may require some uh, development goals, but I think that you know, they are being set up unrealistically, already pointed out. I think that the, these goals are sometimes devoid of what our societies do and how the people live in extreme poor conditions. I think we have never consulted the communities. I think we have never even talked to our communities where we work that, you know, what is it that you want here? You know, uh, are we addressing their problems in terms of access to education, in terms of health? Uh, and, and, and what do you mean by poverty here? Is it a single uh, based uh, measure of income inequality? Or is it expanding people's choices to, uh, uh, to, you know, to, to, to growth or to, uh, to access to any other social services? So we need to look at all these issues, uh, but they are, again, uh, they are at the micro level or perhaps the meso level issues. What we need to really discuss here is how to achieve development in the first place, and by which I mean how to improve the governance uh, of, of South Asia by uh, developing a consensus that here is the governance challenge, here is the framework, and how to the, the, the the, the, the organizations as we are here come together to meet this challenge of governance in South Asia. Um, thank you so much for um, giving me an opportunity and I will end my speech here. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Dr. Khan, for putting a set of um, very important issues for this whole region on the table. And I think uh, your focus on what you call the deep structures approach uh, and your call to look at the governance issue from a non-normative perspective uh, are two uh, concepts I think perhaps we should try to drill down on. 
uh, as we go forward uh, in the in um, in the symposium. Now, the the um, next speaker is Mr. Bahatia uh, Kekulandala, um, who is the coordinator, climate change practical action. Um, his academic and professional training is in ecology, ecosystem services, and climate change, mm -hmm. and he has played a lead role in shaping the work of practical action um, and on research uh, on climate change. Dr. Kekulandala. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I will try to provide uh, some thoughts on why environment or environmental sustainability should be interlinked into the, uh, the post-2015 development agenda. Now, you have already uh, 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 listened uh, to many aspects, and uh, especially on environmental deficit in the, in the MTGs and the post-2015 uh, development agenda that has been uh, discussed, various discussions that has been happening over the last couple of years. As you know, and, uh, uh, sustainability is uh, built up on three pillars. And uh, there have been extensive discussion on social and uh, economic aspects. And let us look at uh, the environmental aspects and see why we need to look at environment in a much more holistic manner. Now, preliminary uh, reflections made on the Millennium Development Goals, especially about MDG 7, highlighted the poor integration of environmental sustainability and poverty reduction. It shows that resources and efforts towards achieving poverty reduction objectives often fail to include an environmental dimension. Similarly, environmental measures operated in a silo. So uh, the integration have been very, very poor. So uh, let us uh, look at how we have changed the face of our ecosystems. These are the four main findings of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Millennium Ecosystem Assessment assess the consequence of ecosystem change for human well-being. And it's a work of more than 1,300 experts, and uh, which basically says over the past 50 to 60 years, we have changed the ecosystems more rapidly than any other comparable time in our human history. So it is basically uh, to meet the needs of increasing global population, uh, to provide food, water, timber, and etc. So this has resulted in irreversible uh, damage to the life on this planet. These changes have benefited the human societies and uh, contributed to enhance the human well-being and economic development for sure, but at what cost? So these changes have been grave in certain areas of the world. So some of the ecosystem changes that has happened in certain uh, parts of the world have brought up grave uh, uh, concerns per, and uh, to many uh, communities. So while some have been benefited, others have been suffered. So uh, let me quickly show you two slides in order to highlight uh, some of these issues, because I can show you 50, 100 slides over the next one and a half years, one, one and a half hours, but I have taken two slides in order to highlight the issue. Now, if you look at this, this shows uh, the extinction rates of our plants and animal species. In the fossil records and the known extinctions that has happened in the, in, in the last century or so, and what has been modeled for the future. So what uh, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment basically tells us is in the recent past, the extinction rate is 1,000 times higher than the fossil records. So then let us go for the other, and it will be uh, more than 1,000 times in the future. See, uh, so are we in the phase of the sixth mass extinction? Now, 
during the geological history of our planet, which is 4.5 billion years, we have seen five mass extinctions. And uh, as per the current knowledge, we, the, we are going into a peak. And if you see, when the number of species goes into a peak, and it falls down. And the last extinction uh, happened 65 million years ago the in terms of dinosaurs. So now, once again, we are peaking up. And uh, if you look at all the data available in uh, various uh, uh, databases, especially if you look at IUCN red list and so on, you see the extinction rates are increasing. And uh, for the first time in the geological history, a one single species is driving a process of mass extinction. That's the difference between the previous five and the current one. Because humans, we as a species, driving the extinction process. And uh, the other important factor is, uh, is after every mass extinction, dominant species dies off. So whether whether we liked it or not, right? If we don't act, we will be gone. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> so this is basically to highlight uh, some of the issues. And also, uh, uh, so what are we going to do about this? And there have been a lot of discussions on how to uh, look at environmental aspects in the post-2015 development agenda. And this is one particular report that have been uh, done. It, uh, you know, there have been a lo lot of discussions uh, uh, over the world. And uh, this uh, report basically provide a uh, lot of approaches and, and uh, discussions and views. And I also, I also think that uh, this particular gathering of uh, people from South Asia and uh, we'll provide an opportunity to look at uh, uh, the South Asian context and how we can uh, look into this issue. And let me finish off by sharing a thought. And uh, this is one of my favorite writers, uh, David Dow, a professor of environment and development. In 2003, he wrote an article to Con Journal of Conservation Biology and, uh, and created a huge fire. So what he basically say, he, he analyzed all our environmental conservation measures over the last 50 years and uh, says we are basically walking north on a southbound train. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bhatti. I must say the uh, current and projected um, extinction rates and the role of human beings in this, what you call it, the sixth mass uh, extinction cycle. Uh, it is more than a little sobering. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Encouraging for all other, <laughs> other beings. <laughs> um, now, the next speaker certainly doesn't need any introduction from me. So um, Priyanti is going to uh, speak. Her presentation is going to be on ensuring that South Asia does not get left behind, addressing the needs of the poor. Thank you very much, Indrajit. Um, um, when I was thinking about this presentation, I was thinking that actually what I'm going to talk about is really a scandal. Uh, because actually, uh, South Asia is not actually being left behind. Uh, if we are to believe the World Bank, uh, South Asia is actually growing. Uh, it is one of the fastest growing regions in the world. Uh, and currently, only three out of the eight South Asian countries are actually uh, now classified as low-income countries. We have India, Pakistan, Bhutan, and Sri Lanka are low-middle-income countries, and the Maldives are upper middle, is, an up, is in the upper-middle-income category. So if we are saying, if we are trying to address the needs of the poorest in South Asia, we can't say uh, growth is, uh, that we, the fact that we are not growing is an issue, uh, or we are being left behind in the global situation is an issue. Uh, we also can see that uh, poverty, uh, uh, the proportion of poor, poor people in South Asia has decreased. 
uh, even if you look at it from the uh, $125 per day uh, issue, or if you look at it from the $2 per day issue, it has decreased. But there are st uh, South Asia is still home to 44% of the developing world's poor, and over a billion people are living on uh, less than $2 a day. So it is uh, the proportion may have decreased, but there are still a lot of South Asians who are not benefiting from this growth. In all the countries of the region, there appears to be a concentrate of, a concentration of wealth in the hands of a few. Uh, average earnings of the richest 10% are eight times the income of the poorest. Uh, and if you look at statistics for some of the countries, you will see that uh, most of the, the, the highest, uh, the, 20, the, the upper 20% 20, 20 of the up, uh, command about 40% of the whole national income. So inequality, uh, so even though the South Asian countries are not being left behind in terms of growth, uh, inequality is a huge issue. Uh, and um, so trickle down, the growth, the famous trickle down, or let's um, increase the pie before we share it kind of theory, doesn't, doesn't seem to quite work in South Asia. Uh, and that's not really very surprising to me because it doesn't seem to be working in the rest of the world either. Uh, the richest 1% in the world increased, we have been told, increased their income by 60% during, the, uh, during 1999 to 2010. And last year, the world's richest people amassed a wealth of, I can't even figure out how much this is, US dollars 240 billion. But I can think that a lot of that would have helped address some of the issues of, uh, the, of poor people. Um, in South Asia, on the other hand, we have 250 million children who are undernourished. We have 30 million children who do not go to school. We have one third of adult women who are anemic. So, and, and the list could go on. Uh, so actually, the trickle down actually doesn't happen. Or somebody told me when I said this to them, it is happening, but it's not happening fast enough. So what I really want to say very quickly is who is being left out behind and excluded. And uh, some of these uh, statistics show us who they are. And uh, more important, talk about a little bit, or get us to think a little bit about why they are being left behind. If you look at who is being left behind, uh, I would say that uh, overall there are three, three reasons why people are being left behind. One is that we, uh, people are left behind because they are multidimensionally deprived. They're not just deprived because of income, but they are also deprived because of their social status, etc. And people who are, or because they're disabled, or because they're old, or, 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 where they, or because of where they live. So the, the, if, you're, if you're likely to be having a number of these deprivations, then you're likely not to be caught by the whole development process, and you're likely not to be able to benefit from it. Um, Dr. Nidhi Sabawalde talked this afternoon about exclusion in included uh, induced uh, deprivation, which is about the fact that despite uh, that uh, people who have social, uh, who are socially excluded, uh, tend to have a, a lesser chance of of, develop, of accessing development or accessing services than people who are not. And then, of course, there's a whole geographical issue of not just countries that are poor, but also within countries, areas that are poor. And in Sri Lanka, we talk about conflict, the war-affected areas, but we also talk about areas like uh, uh, Badulla, which has not actually achieved, uh, been a um, uh, recipient of certain development resources. But I think if you go to the question why, I think it's the, the issue is that we are trying to solve the problems that we create by using the same kind of thinking that we used when we created them. And I think that is, uh, that is a call to arms, really, that we need to think slightly differently. Uh, and if um, in, in the JIT and um, Debs have already talked about what we learned from the uh, MDG experience, there might be a good reason why we thought the MDGs need to be simple and measurable. But we can, we all know that poverty and poor people, are, to think about poverty is not a simply and measurable issue. 
And if we confine ourselves to simply and uh, simple and measurable, and there's some conversation about the post-2015, how can we make it simple? Because the MDGs worked because they, they were simple. We might get easy buy-in, and we might get easy buy-in from people, but we may not actually resolve the problems. Uh, we also know from the MDGs that the narrow focus on national and global averages hid a lot of the inequalities and the, and the pockets of poverty that actually existed. We also know that uh, the MDGs didn't really address inequality, and it's good to see inequality back on the agenda. But also, we need to look at overlapping inequalities, this whole thing of multidimensional de depravity. Uh, we talked about this before. There was a certain politics behind the, uh, behind the MDG um, genesis. Uh, but there is also, we can't forget that there are certain vested interests. There's a whole north-south uh, vested interest. There's also interests of global capital versus local uh, economies. And so there is a whole heap of politics that we'll need to go that we need to actually acknowledge and deal with if you're going into the new agenda and one of the things that has always worried me when we talk about inequalities and rights and the needing to have a rights agenda for the uh, post-2015 is the fact that the MDGs actually sidestepped a lot of the international conventions I think I mean I I was uh, I was there in the, in the whole discussion leading to Beijing Platform for Action. We had CEDAW from a gender perspective. All those things somehow got slightly sidelined because we had a, this concentration on some very simple and measurable gender equality goals. And those are the, those are the conventions, uh, including that, the Human Rights Convention, the conventions on social econ We have the instruments that have actually, have, that have actually highlighted and provided us uh, uh, a framework for dealing with, um, with inequalities. And I'm not sure we are giving that as much credence as we should. Uh, so I think we got a bit lost on the way uh, in the MDG conversation. We achieved some things, but we got a bit lost. And I think uh, the challenge here for us in the next two days and in the process that Deb's uh, outlined for us for the future is that we need to get back on track. Um, and in South Asia, we really need to get back on track. We need to look at sustainable development. Uh, um, we need to think of a development model that is replicable and lasting. I think this was a quote that comes from Dr. Garmini Korea, who, the late Dr. Garmini Korea, uh, when he was Secretary General of UNCTAD, because he, he was saying that development needs to be s replicable. And if you re start re uh, replicating the current model of development, we are going to go into an infinite growth of material consumption in a finite world, which my other uh, sort of main, um, uh, thinker that I have had a lot to do with, is E.F. Schumacher, said was actually an impossibility. Uh, I've talked about the scandal of inequality in South Asia, so inclusivity and equality is cr are critical. Uh, and it's critical because we are talking about the rights of people, and people are important. But also, I think, from a purely practical perspective, I think we need to recognize that equality is important. Uh, uh, even the IMF is beginning to recognize that growth is more sustainable if incomes are more equal. And that societies, and we know that societies are likely to be more sustainable. They, they're likely to be more secure, more free from conflict, uh, if there is less uh, inequality. And I think in this whole thing, we need to kind of begin to start thinking, uh, revisiting the notion that free trade and economic liberal liberalization is the only way forward. There, must, there, there are conversations now happening that are going back to the thinking about the commons, about um, sustainable and secure uh, economies. And uh, we need to go back to that, those conversations. Uh, so I think that's my challenge to you this morning and for the next two days. Thank you. Th th thank you. Thank you very much. Priyanti has reminded us very vividly that uh, while some progress is being made in terms of addressing poverty in our region, uh, there is obviously considerably a, a massive backlog that still needs to be addressed. Okay. Um, Thank you very much to the speakers, really, for broadly sticking to time. We've got about, how long? 10 minutes? 15 minutes. 15 minutes um, 
for a uh, Q and A. So the floor is open. Any comments? Yes, comments as well. Absolutely. <laughs> comments, clarifications, questions. Which means the one who is going to ask the question will give the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Please. If you'd identify yourself the first time you speak, and then. Yes, uh, Hiro Kohama. Uh, I teach economics at the University of Shizuoka in Japan. Uh, in the last presentation, Ms. Fernando mentioned in her slide, growth is more sustainable if incomes are more equal. Is this established uh, theory or theorem in development economics? Uh, this is my rather technical question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, it is, I don't know whether it's an, it's, I'm, not an economist, so it's a bit difficult for me to answer that. But uh, but it's in the established economics uh, systems. But I think people are beginning to realize that growth uh, that, that there is data to show that more economies that are more equal have a more chance of growing, especially after the growing after the middle income uh, after you get to the middle income uh, level. So it's a lot of the data that's coming out uh, coming out of the I I IFIs are actually showing that. Sure, at the back there, please. Can I also add to that answer? Sure. Um, if you are interested in a particular study, you may want to... Vi if you want to... Uh, refer to a particular study, you might want to see the work of Ravelin and Chandy. And Brookings Institution has done a lot of work on how inequality actually contributes to sustainable development and growth, actually. Because they do find that once you reach the middle income level, the more unequal the society is, the harder it is for the country to develop even economically. So you might uh, you might want to check out their research. Yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Andrew Scott from the Overseas Development Institute in, in London. Um, it, it's actually quite difficult to ask any real questions because they're very comprehensive presentations. Um, so I, I thought I'd add, maybe add just one or two points and, and thoughts in, in response to all, all of the, the presenters. Um, first, one, one uh, small addition to Dr. Bhattacharya's uh, outlining of the different processes, um, which is the interesting financing for development panel of eminent persons, which is also due to report um, towards the autumn of uh, next year. Uh, and the intention is that uh, the conclusions of that report and the conclusions of the open working group are then combined into one negotiation process in 2015. Um, so um, the, 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 the intention anyway, at least of the, the, the UN officials, is, is to, to bring all of these processes together um, when they start formulating the negotiating document. Um, uh, and I think the point is also, as Dr. Bhattacharya is pointing out, that that, that negotiating document has yet to be written. Um, uh, and the open working group itself is still in the process of um, hearing what other people have to say and is yet to form any firm conclusions. Um, they won't actually start writing anything uh, in, by way of conclusions until about um, March, April, May next year. Um, and my impression anyway, is having had uh, some slight engagement myself with them, is, is that they are, they are very much at the moment still open-minded and still figuring out what the issues are. Um, but also, point, as Dr. Bhattacharya pointed out, most of those involved in the process from the member states of the United Nations are diplomats. They're not specialists either in economics or social development or environmental sustainability. Um, and their focus is more on the negotiation process than the actual substantive content of, of what they're going to be negotiating. Um, so I think that, that there's still a need for a great deal of, of uh, continuing input into the process. Um, maybe just a final comment is, is, uh, is a question a little bit about what we want the post-2015 development agenda 
to be, um, even if it has a 15-year period to it, it's not going to deliver sustainable development. Um, and the question is, do we want it to be delivering us onto our pathway to sustainable development, uh, and how far along that pathway do we want to go? And secondly, the post-2015 development agenda is also going to have a limited number of goals to it. That's, that's pretty certain. Um, it may be one or two more than the MDGs, but it's still going to be a relatively small number of goals. And the question then becomes, what are the priorities that we want to see in that smaller set of goals, given the enormous range of issues that we've been hearing about this morning? Mm -hmm. Please. Uh, hi, I'm Avnish. I teach in Management Development Institute in India in the area of public policy and governance. Uh, with the uh, topic of the session, setting the context, uh, what I believe is that there are two ways the presenters have seen, and I think the outside world is also seeing the same. Uh, one is to see millennium development goal as millennium development gaps. The other perspective could be that can we see millennium development goal as millennium development guarantees? And when we are setting the context, uh, if we can divide between what was said by Dave as well as my friend from SDPI and the other presenters, that if we are talking about the process to achieve MDG, that is the strategy. And the second, we are talking about the product, defining the product, that what does poverty, what does education mean? Because there was a comment by Dave that talking about outcome. And I can give you a very classical example from a, a South Asian person who is very well known, Ravindranath Tagore. As per the definition of literate, he was never a literate person because he never went to a school, but he got a noble in English. So, so <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that if the session can highlight uh, by defining certain products, like, uh, or take some kind of attempt to raise that issue. And secondly, what are the strategy, the processes? Because when we talk about governance, how do we define it? How do we make it simple? That is something that will help. Mm. Mm. Very much. I think it's on. I think it's on. I'm Anila Banda, and I retired from public service six years ago, so I have time to reflect. <laughs> I would just like to start off from where Priyanti ended off, uh, this issue of the, the, the inequality. And I think what, I, what we see is there's a lot of focus on what's lacking at the lower end of the human spectrum. Uh, and I think you can't look only at that without looking at the other end, the consumption at the richest end. And unless there is, con and it's not even clear to me that uh, the consumption at the upper end necessarily makes people more contented. And still, when you look at the corporates, when you look at businesses, it's the bottom line and the, sh the responsibility to the shareholder that matters. But one cannot really make change unless there is a conviction that greater material consumption is the best thing going. Because if there is a conviction, whether it is in, employ in employment, in businesses, that whatever is earned can be uh, distributed with higher you know, wages to the employees and not necessarily going back to the shareholders, there is you how are you going to make the change so this whole co idea that you know that the of the consum the, the 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 kind of open ended consumption at the upper end and in south asia you see it you know we are talking about being left out in south asia the inequalities are i think sri lanka is in some senses less so and we we certainly don't have the problems of the gender issues and all that some of the other countries have so if we set example by recognizing that excessive consumption at the upper end has to come down so that at the lower end, people can uh, have a better quality of life, uh, we, we, there could be change. But until that is recognized, so long as there is a conviction in the human spirit that consumption is the best thing going, you know, more material stuff, you know. I mean, at the upper end, people are spending huge amounts to go and live in poverty, you know, uh, live in wild places, remote from everywhere, uh, eating, you know, a vegetarian diet, it, it's fashionable. 
but that's what most of the poor do in our part of the, in South Asia. So I think we cannot only look at the lower end. The su sustainability has to come by also looking at the upper end and creating some conviction that that you come back, you, that you come to, uh, re you know, I won't use the word regressing, progressing to the mean, which is I think the. Uh, the issue that uh, Priyanti spoke about. So really, I think the dialogue can, can, has to change. You have to look at both ends of the spectrum if we want to make change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we take one more comment, and then I'll uh, uh, ask the um, uh, speakers whether they, they, they'd like to respond. Yeah. Um, I'm Pooja. I represent Vadana Todo Abhiyan. It's a national campaign from India. Uh, and I'm very encouraged to hear that, I mean, apart from the three main principal sort of uh, frames, uh, that is environmental, economic, and social, we also dealt, and it's kind of setting the tone, uh, we looked at good governance, just governance, and we also talked about equality, justice uh, principles, human rights principles. However, uh, just to kind of maybe put it across and uh, something that could be reflected and also maybe like a question that some of you could maybe look at, is that one of the criticisms of the MDGs was that it was not really, it didn't arrive after a you know, process of uh, you know, extensive consultations or there was not much of negotiations done in that. And something that they tried to correct was through the entire process of consultations that happened in the uh, last year. and you know, that have uh, kind of uh, happened now. But uh, what we uh, heard after the 68th uh, General Assembly that was just in September, uh, got over just recently, was that now the heads of state would be kind of setting aside all the recommendations that have come in till now and look afresh. And so the high-level political forum would almost like, you know, maybe start from scratch and take these as considerations. So does that seem as, uh, in a sense, undoing the consultative processes that have happened? Or would you see this as more of just adding on to what has already come in? So just something that. Thank you very much. Let me just now give the uh, speaker the chance to respond. Dr. Bhattacharya, if you would start, please. I think the floor feedback was fantastic. I think uh, it was very, very inspiring because I think that we are getting to the issues. But let me first make a general point. I think you're giving me five minutes? No, no, no. Five minutes, end of session. Oh. Five minutes to fit I got, everybody in. I got so encouraged. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, um, four people in five minutes. Okay, let, let me take uh, 10 seconds each on each issue. I think we can always have a general discussion on development, our national goals, our strategies, and all the deficits we have in our country. But this is not what we are discussing here. We are discussing how does our national priorities fit in into a globally agreed development framework. I think it's a totally we will get wrong because we can go on and discussing all the problems we have in our respective countries, but we will not add any value to that particular discussion in terms of having a framework, a set of goals, a limited set of goals, and some targets and some indicators in that way. Please keep that in mind. This is not a discussion about general development strategy. It is all about linking our problems to the current discourse over there. This is number one. So it's a bit different. Uh, for example, Dr. Khan mentioned about all the governance problem. I cannot agree more. That was a fantastic elaboration of all the governance problems we have. But do you want to make them the domain of international policymakers? You see, if you put human rights as an agenda in a global international framework, do you think my prime minister is going to agree to that? Will your prime minister agree to that? That the human rights situation will be assessed every other time by the global, global development community? I don't think it's politically feasible at all. Uh, whether I like it or not is a different issue. But I'm talking about feasibility. And do we really want to do that or not, even within the days of globalized sovereignty? Number two. Number three, on this global uh, the environment issue. Now, you see, Priyanti, all those things you have said, I fully agree with you. But how do you relate it to the MDG or post-2015 framework? Look at what is happening. Relate it to the realities, because that is what is important. Look at what, uh, what is happening. There are four areas of consensus. And somebody discussed that concrete outputs we should relate to. There are four areas of consensus. These things are going to be there in the whatever way in the post-2015 will be there. One is the issue of water and sanitation. 
One is the issue of energy. One is the issue of uh, sustainable agriculture along with food security, nutrition, and everything else, uh, land use. And the fourth one is management of natural resources. These are the four areas of sustainable development or the quote-unquote environmental agenda which will be there. Are we happy with that? Do you want something else? If you are happy with that, what are the indicators you are looking for? Be concrete and be proactive and be constructive over there. Just debating how, many, how, how bad things are is not very useful because we are all converted. We are all agreed on that particular issue. So let us move the debate a bit forward. But you see, I, I find it very surprising. You mention all these things, and somebody mentioned about that uh, issue, thankfully, is about the consumption issue. Look at all the, da da all the uh, goals and indicators. Where is this greenhouse emission control? There is nowhere. What about sustainable consumption? It is nowhere. I don't hear any criticism from you from this house that telling that, we, yes, we are getting, uh, that's what the point I said, you win, lose, lose. You lose the development focus and you don't gain anything in the environment because nothing is being said on controlling the greenhouse emission where the developed country is supposed to take on some responsibilities. You are all discussing the, again, a national priorities, but you're talking about a universal framework, but in terms of the rights and obligations of the universal community in, in certain ways over there. So I think we need to move the debate. We need to move the debate. We are still very nationally oriented, but asking for a universal framework without understanding what type of indicators and goals, it really makes the balance between our national priorities and universal um, um, universal responsibilities in that way. Uh, there are two, two, three other issues which you could have gone. On the, this whole debate on growth, inequality, and how this absent, the mainstream consensus at this moment is that inconclusive. It is your choice, which side of the debate you want to take to. Because re literature, evidence plays both ways in that way. But there is still a middle ground where we, can, we, where we agree, even the World Bank comes and agrees with that. It is that, and it is really difficult to have the marginal growth marginal incremental growth when you are becoming more unequal. So the more point is that when we talk about the inclusive growth nowadays, what are the new instruments we are bringing in on board, apart from the go growth issue, whatever way we do on comparative advantage or competitive advantage. The new issue on discussion is social protection. I think this new issue on the policy issue is social protection. And Brazil has shown the way that even with the social protection you can reach out and that is the role of the state and there the capacity of the state will come in again that with public expenditure issues and macroeconomic framework you can reach out over there even countries with low income can still afford a better universal coverage of social protection in different ways of addressing those kind of shortfalls which Priyanti is so unhappy about thank you very much thank you thank you Bhattari. I mean I think that's a very useful uh, contribution to discipline us in terms of how we proceed. I, I think that's a very good framework we need to keep in mind as we go forward. Dr. Khan, do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, just very briefly, uh, I would like to add this. Uh, you know, we, this, this national consensus is also important because we also need to see that the government's approving these kind of MGDs. Because if, unless there is a universal agreement at that level, there should also be an agreement within the state's level. So we also need to look at the, 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 our, our issues, which sort of affect on the life, so on the growth of, uh, of our countries. But at the same time, there has to be some kind of political commitments because this, even if you make this framework uh, agreeing all that this is what we want, these are the kind of MDGs that we want to agree to, but it comes to actually the responsibility of the state who are trying to achieve this. So there has to be some kind of political commitment, and rightly so, as you have mentioned it, it has to be something on the agenda which can be done, which can be financed, and which can be, for which we can uh, have some kind of a consensus here. So yes, I think that we have to move uh, towards that um, uh, agenda of trying to look at you know what is it that we want from this uh, uh, this this conference here? What kind of what kind of issues do you really want to address here? And you know how how to go about them? But we need to be mindful of the fact that there are also about the political commitments here. Thank you. Thank you very much. The other two speakers have uh, very generously given up their time so that we can finish broadly uh, on schedule. Um, I'm going to be very brief in my final remarks. 
this uh, the presentations, the excellent presentations as well as the uh, discussion have been extremely rich. But the richness of the session we've had is at the same time both encouraging and daunting. <coughs> it's great that we've been able to have this very um, substantive and excellent exchange, but what it has brought out is that really to try to make sense of this whole agenda is going to be extremely challenging. How one you know, balances, you know, how does one promote synergies across the different pillars and avoid trade-offs to capture all the kind of nuances and the complexity, at the same time end up with a measurable, uh, um, you know, I mean, uh, and, and, and monitorable framework. Um, now, Priyanti pointed out that you know, one can go too far in the direction of just coming out with something that you can measure and monitor which is what perhaps happened last time. But at the same time, you do have to end up there. That's where the whole process ends up. So how we do this, um, if we can uh, crack that or make some contributions towards cracking uh, what is a really a pretty tough conundrum, I think we would have achieved a lot over the next two days. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much to our speakers in particular, and thank you to all of you.